Hey, welcome to another episode of Marketing Against the Grain. I am your host, Kieran Flanagan. And in this episode, we are going to talk about $3 billion frameworks that have grew phenomenal companies that you have definitely heard about. We are going to tell you why you don't need to be world-class at everything. You just need to be world-class at one thing. episode of Marketing Against the Grain. I am doing the host because Kiff sounds like he is one of the zombies from Last of Us. I hate zombie shows. Shout out to Kip for actually doing the show still, still sick. And we have a good show. One of the things we wanted to talk to you about is some of the core frameworks that have led to billion dollar companies, multi-billion dollar companies actually. And there's like a really good lesson for everyone in the things that we are going to cover, which is there is this kind of narrative out there and you know people like Gary Vaynerchuk who shout out I am not a hater I think he's a phenomenal person I love I told Gary you my, I think he's a really good marketer yeah, yeah he's an incredible marketer did I ever tell you I told you my Gary story when I was on stage with him and he basically told me the fuck uh, up. oh yeah you gotta tell the audience now though you may have told me <laughs> but now you gotta tell everybody in Dublin there was this really large event and I was doing a panel and he was on the panel I think he might have been doing a bunch of things but he was on this panel and there was four of us on the panel Gary was one of them, all other three people, everyone was just in awe of him on the panel. So everyone was just like agreeing with everything he said. And so I was like, oh, okay, well, like, let's try to liven this up and have some debate. And <laughs> actually there's, there's one thing I do believe in, which is small companies should not try to spread themselves across everything. They should just try to find a couple of things that they can be truly great at. And his feeling is the opposite, whether he believes it or not. He's like, oh, like you should be on every social channel. You should be building your audience everywhere. And I was like, hey, that's probably impossible. Like, do you remember what it was like to be a small company? And he kind of went on this spiel of how he does it and repurposes content and all this good stuff. So the next week, they emailed everyone who went to the event and then emailed the link to that video. And I was like, oh, wow, like I'm on the video. Go check it out with Gary Vaynerchuk, see how that debate came across. Yeah. And like the video had hundreds of thousands of views because I think he reposted to his channel. And like all of the comments were it was like, who is this schmuck to be arguing with Gary Vaynerchuk? <laughs> Who is this? User? Who is this idiot? I can't understand what he's saying. What is that accent? <laughs> I can't understand what he's saying. That's amazing. I know. I was like, oh my god. Okay. There's no winning debates for people who have fanatical fans. Anyway. But from that YouTube trauma comes today's show because comes today's you show. do believe that hey, one channel and having a very clear, successful strategy on that channel can transform a business, and that's basically what we're going to talk about today, right? right? I think there's some things that have become ubiquitous across B2B tech and then even B2C because they have been proven to be scalable. They have been proven to be copyable and they have proven to work. And we are going to talk about a couple of those frameworks on this show and why we think they worked. So we can start with the first one that I think is very, very popular across the entirety of B2B. Like every <laughs> company I invest in or any founder I talk to is like, hey, do you know how we can do the template thing? I love that that's the, that's the official name. Like, how do we do this template thing? And the template thing is, how do you break up your product? Or how do you actually build a whole marketplace or directory of jobs to be done around your product, templatize them, and then actually get people to find them and discover them on Google? And then when you actually go into the product, you can activate on that template. And all of the data shows that that is a great way to grow search traffic. Uh, Canva, who kind of grew through word of mouth, actually layered on templates. They grew at about a couple of hundred percent just through the search mechanics, but they actually improved their user activation by 40%. User activation for all of our listeners is when a user size into the product and they really get the value of the product and that usually correlates to you making more revenue. And so that's the template thing. We hold can, on, hold on. Can, can, you, can you give us a breakdown of a very specific example of like, a keyword, an example template for the company, like how it would all work. Right. So Canva has, I think, hundreds of thousands of templates. Mm -hmm. So if I'm looking for a Facebook lead thumbnail, or I'm looking for a invoice template, or I'm looking for a how to send birthday invite, they like birthday invite templates. So they have templates for any singular design thing you could possibly want, right? Ready-made templates where you can drag and drop things onto that template. And all of those templates rank really well in search and they're very specific to what that person is searching for. And so if someone will sign up, come in and then activate on that template, which is like, oh, I'll use this template, drag and drop it, and then actually get immediate value from the product. Yeah, and Kieran, there might be some people listening to this being like, hey, if I'm a small company or if I don't have a lot of you know experience in this, like how am I ever gonna get any traffic from Google for things like this? And I think the magic of this particular strategy is, 
these keyword search queries are so, so niche that most of the results are terrible, right? And if you can provide real value for these very niche and specific keywords, you can actually rank very high and you also have very high click-through rate and engagement on your search engine result page. Is that is that right? Is that how everybody should be thinking about this? Yeah, I think you should think about a couple of ingredients to matter and I'll interchange examples from Canva, Miro, Figma, and even Zapier because Zapier has a really large template library and app marketplace. And so first of all, to your point, you need volume. And so the reason templates work really well is because you can generate a lot of them and they're applicable to your product, usually for horizontal products. Like what do we mean by horizontal products? We mean your product actually has lots and lots of use cases. Broad use cases. Broad use cases for the general, like a very general audience. It's not like specifically for one role or specifically for one type of person. And so if you think about it, Canva is really for anyone who needs design. And that can be from anywhere from a professional marketer all the way to like a small business owner to anyone. Miro is a really great way to actually do whiteboarding and collaboration. Again, very horizontal use case, Figma design, maybe a little bit more specific to designers, Zapier, very horizontal use case. So first of all, you need quantity, right? You need, to your point, like small amount of traffic, but actually very, very targeted And so it generates a lot of great signups and generates a lot of revenue, but only really is worth doing if you can imagine yourself creating lots of them, like not like, how do I create 10 templates? Because that's all that's really applicable to my product. It's not really going to be worth it. But if I can create tens of thousands, then it starts to get really meaningful and really impactful. And like you and I have talked with the Canva folks a lot. And what they really did is they came up with these templates. And I I believe they outsourced the design and production of these templates to kind of offshore firms like in the Philippines and other low cost locations so that they could basically manually create this template at a very low cost for a very specific keyword. And then they would rank for that keyword and have, you know, 100, 1,000, 2,000 people a month come in, visit that template, and to go and and actually use that template within Canva, you had to sign up for Canva. Is that right? Right. So Canva's example is like, so there's there's a really great actually lesson here. So like we create all the templates. When this stuff gets really interesting, which is some of the other examples I want to use is when you can figure out incentives to get other people. Yes, that's why I'm, pu- that's why I'm pushing on this. Right. Because then that starts to really scale. And that's, Canva just were able to scale through large outsource team and just crank through thousands and thousands of templates. And obviously it was within their product. And so they could do it in a very templatized way themselves. But then you have the likes of Figma and Figma have their community creating templates because designers want to actually create templates because it's part of their portfolio of work. Yes. It's part of how they can actually show they're a really great designer. Miro actually have, Miro's is really interesting because it's actually somewhat customer success stories in some ways, oh, like case studies, because they actually have customers actually add their favorite templates that they are using. And they have influencers who get a lot of value from their product, create templates and, and templates in what they call the mirrorverse, which is like a really interesting thing, right? They actually both show how customers are using these templates to get value from, but then they actually market those to other people to acquire net new people. So a really nice loop, which is like, reinforces yeah. the value of the product because it says like, here's actually some real companies, like they have Airtable's templates up there. Wow, like Airtable are using Miro. That's pretty, that's that's a pretty good signal that this is a great product. But then net you people are finding these templates and saying, wow, like these are really useful to me. What is this product? I need to check it out more. Yeah, and, and I think what's interesting, right, is that, that, that this play is predicated on very specific search terms, but it's scaled in many different ways. You know, kind of Canva started scaling this strategy through creating templates of their own. And their secret sauce was creating those templates at low cost and actually internationalizing them quickly. They were able to take those templates across, I think like 50 different languages, and that'll enable them to really scale traffic in a very fast way. Then Figma basically turn the work that their community was already doing and made it work in public to make those templates. And Miro basically then say, hey, I'm actually going to take that a step further and showcase like the best brands and the best like high scale users of my platforms, like how they actually use it for their business versus Figma was a lot of like, hey, I'm an independent designer and I'm, I focus on this thing. So I've got a bunch of great templates on user experience or what what have you, right? In my, my area of expertise. And then you went to more functional templates with Airtable of like, hey, this is how we run our our business using Miro and like these are the specific templates we use, right? Right. And it's very interesting to see how that one strategy 
which is, hey, people search for this thing and we want to give them a lot of value through a template and onboard them onto our tool, can manifest and scale in a bunch of different ways so that you could actually run this play very differently. And now with AI, I think there's going to be new iterations of this play, but like, it's not just everybody went and did it the exact same way. Yeah, you know, there's a really interesting conversation here. So actually, so Canva added in user-generated content into their template because they added the marketplace, which is really clever. And so now you can actually sell your templates through Canva. And so you actually get a whole new kind of access of Super like smart. people, yes, of people adding their templates, but also premium templates for people to actually buy. What's super interesting actually is what is user-generated content in an AI world? Because <laughs> I knew you were going to come here. Yeah, because user-generated content is like one of the most impact. Like the second thing we're going to talk about is actually user-generated SEO loops. And that's mm -hmm. one of the other big growth frameworks we're going to talk about. Maybe we'll talk about it actually in the second example, because AI, in a lot of cases, you could argue like user-generated content is great because it's much more scalable. But AI takes away the need for that in a lot of cases because AI is pretty scalable if you can teach it how to create mm -hmm. templates and just iterate through them. And so I do wonder what any of this stuff is in an AI world. Like, how does it look? Like, I can just replicate Canva's template library if I can teach an AI to build these templates myself. Yeah, you know, the argument I'd make for our audience listening, right, is I think there's still the need for a human to say, hey, here are these things that people care about that I need to go and, and figure out a way to create a template around, whether it be a business document, some design thing. There's a whole host of ways that you can do this. And this is not just a software company thing. But what I actually think AI is going to play a big role in, Kieran, is the optimizing of that template, right? Like AI is going to be able to iterate and improve that template so that the click-through rate gets higher, that the actual usage of that template improves so that people can then go and adopt that product or adopt the service that relates to that template that is why the business actually created it to begin with, right? And I think AI's role in this particular strategy is going to be very iterative. You, we have to think most of the kind of testing iteration AI that we have right now is like Google AdWords and Facebook ads. We're going to bring that to our kind of owned SEO strategies in a much better way with AI. And I think that will be very transformative to marketers. I think you still need a human to be the editor, which is basically yes. you're saying like they dictate somewhat of like the editorial calendar. So like I dictate the editorial calendar of all of the templates I want built. And the AI can build all of the templates and I can iterate and tweak to make sure they match. But with GPT-4 coming, we're going to talk about this. Like, and the oh, multi so much to talk about there. The multimodal aspect of that, which like how easy is it for me to just feed in all of these different niche keywords, I could. I wonder if I could feed in anything from Canva. I bet you <laughs> could. I, we'll play with it and do some cool stuff. Scrape their templates. Because I think the template, if you look at Figma, bought for 10 billion. If you look at Miro, their last raise was 19 billion. If you look at Canva, their last raise was 40 billion. Like there's just these billion dollar companies. The template has been a fundamental part of how they've grown because they're a horizontal product. It teaches someone how to use the product because it gives them a real use case, but it actually generates a ton of demand. So I think it's really defensible. I wonder how that looks in an AI world because I can just maybe replicate that much faster. I think it's still I think it's still defensible, but what you have to have is the person and team running that program has to obsess about value, right? Like AI can create iterate templates, but like how good are they? How valuable are they? How different are they from what everybody else is doing? The human layer there is like, it's not just about scale. It's not just about having... 10,000 templates overnight. It's about having the 10,000 most valuable templates overnight, right? right? And when I think about this strategy is AI is going to be best deployed when it's through the lens of like maximizing value to the customer and to the user. And I think that's where we're, we're going to get to. In between there and here, we're going to mess some stuff up and people are going to do a bunch of spammy shit and it's going to be really ugly and, and everything. But I think that's where we'll, we'll end up. So the second one is an example of maybe how we need to start thinking about defensibility because it actually adds additional value that you can't get from an AI. So the second one is really these user-generated SEO loops. And I've used the example of genius.com, but I want to use it again, but then tell you some other examples of it. So one of my favorite examples of a brand using smart marketing and growth to disrupt an existing market and a very applicable actually to some of the AI conversations we were having because yes. it was when Lyric's websites were like very getting very, very popular. If you think about AI, like most AI companies are a wrapper around a backend AI large language model. And so how do you differentiate? Well, with great growth, great community, great marketing. 
Similar in lyrics, like lyrics are lyrics. So you were just republishing lyrics. How do you actually differentiate? And so Genius.com, which I think was Rap Genius back in the uh, it was. time. I was on Rap Genius, like learning the lyrics. I mean, are you down, a Rap Genius? Throwing down some hot bars. Rapper Kieran might be my least favorite did, Kieran. Did I ever show you the, the awesome thing I did on Fiverr when me, me and my brother battle rap through puppets? Oh, you did. You did. You sent me the Fiverr ba battle rap puppets. Me and my brother. So we we would like write battle raps against each other. And then we would pay a guy on Fiverr to like wrap them through like something that looked like it was on Sesame Street. And we would send them to each other as like, hey, I'm dissing you on this. And then he would diss me back. It was pretty good. It was a good time. Uh, it was Karen, a good time. You know, I, I, do, I do love you, but your credibility to me as a battle rapper is zero you, minus all one. Right, all right. How about this then? For the audience on YouTube, can we, can we put this up, Darren? I'll make sure it's clean. Can I diss Kip through a Fiverr video and can we put it up on YouTube? Yeah, we'll put it up on right. our YouTube. Sure. The gauntlet is go, thrown, go, thrown go down. All right. Okay. Yeah, the that's the audience be, wants to hear your sweet, sick bars, my friend. This is going to happen this week. And so we can publish it next week and we will see if you have any reply to my hot <laughs> Donegal rap bars. <laughs> Please, uh, I want it. Let's do it. Okay. Genius.com. So rap, back then, Rap Genius. So how could you actually get any type of meaningful differentiation there? And they did something so simple that I think was really awesome. They added a product feature that allowed you to annotate lyrics. And so any anyone who is actually really into hip hop, hip hop is really all I listen to. You really care about what the different bars mean. You care about what the different lyrics mean because sometimes they're dissing people and you're like annotated and you're like, oh, what they actually mean by this is this, this, this. And so it added in an element that they had that no one else had and made their content yes. much more rich, much more rankable in Google and they, they became genius.com. And so that's a really great example of like, how do I actually get my users to participate in the things that I'm doing? Add some additional value so I can differentiate my content from anyone else. There's obviously the most common examples of this are Stack Overflow, although I do think they're in a bit of bother with AI. They closed off their site to AI because they're worried about AI being able to answer all the questions. Yeah, I think they're having some AI threats on Stack Overflow, but there were, look, pre-AI community was how you actually scaled knowledge. And what AI is basically just doing is taking all that community knowledge and I'm making it much easier, interface. easily accessible. And so, yeah, it's going to disrupt some businesses like Stack Overflow, but it doesn't mean that the growth mechanic that they used wasn't important and still might not be important. It still could be very important for, for several businesses in the future. And th that annotation feature, I actually had an idea again, shout out to anyone who wants to build these things. It was like a plugin where I could, so you, you could follow people. So like if I, I had to have the plugin, but I could actually start to build out my network on the plugin. <clears throat> so I could follow you. I could follow uh, Nicholas Holland, who's, who's mm -hmm. a good friend of ours. I wanted to follow him because he reads really interesting stuff. So anyone I think is reading interesting things. And then the little group, this is actually a really good idea. So I think I'm going to build I this. I think I know where you're going and I kind of like it. Keep <clears throat> going, keep going. And so you so you would highlight things and I could see everyone's, in a, my only in my group, I could see the things that they had read and the commentary that they added. Because mm. actually all of the, the best stuff that I get information on used to come through Slack with commentary about like why this article was interesting. Well, I would love to just like click on a plugin and it gives me all of the things that you are all reading. And then I can actually read your commentary where you actually said, oh, this is like cool. This is cool. What an awesome idea. Kip, do you want to fund me? Can I pitch you one tweak on your idea? Okay, tweak it. You know me, Kieran, I don't love humans. I'm okay with humans, but I'm not the best with humans. And You're agnostic to heat humans. <laughs> I am, I am. I'm much better with inanimate <laughs> objects and problems than human emotion. Human emotion and I have a, we have a hard time Human sometimes. emotion does not compute. Well, it's no, not rational. Emotion. It's not rational. And <laughs> so therefore it does logical. not compute, I, right? I do, and, and I do so agree. One of the things I have a lot of anxiety over is just like message threads with other people. Because I'm like, oh man, like Kieran and I have the best message threads because there's, it's just like links and commentary back to each other. And like, there's never like, oh, how do you feel about this thing? <laughs> or like, are you happy today? <laughs> And I'm like, no, there, there, there's zero emotion, <laughs> zero emotion. But what I'm getting to is I thought you were going to say, hey, I want to have like an annotation messaging thread instead of with a person at the center with a piece of content at the center. Like I it would be sick if I was oh, just like, cool. oh, I had this link and all of like, and I could just have a separate DM thread with you and Nick and Within Megan and a bunch of our friends just around that specific thing. Like I would love that. Embed the thread within the content. Yeah. So instead of, <laughs> instead of us, having like this one big long group yeah. thread where we can never find anything like cool here's all these topics that we have like group threads around this specific topic and like handful of pieces of information and content would be like way better for me yeah something like that should exist i know rewind are doing this where you can actually 
So Rewind is a tool that basically tracks what you were doing on the browser, and then you can basically replay anything you did to find the things that you were doing. So like, oh, find me the note I took, find me the browser that I went to to find travel things. It, and they I mean, just added, it's, it's really just a fast way to find one of the hundred tabs that I have open. <laughs> and e- e- even that would save me about an hour a day, totally, but they added, totally. they added AI. So now I can just talk to the chatbot and say like, oh, what are the things I did today? And it would build out all of the things I did today. So there's some version of that for content, which is like, hey, there's group thread for all of the content we're creating and making sure you get more more meaningful value from it. So, okay, what are what are we saying to our listeners here? What are we saying to our <laughs> listeners what we, here? What are, we, what are we saying to you all in this segment here? <laughs> we are saying that Kieran, there is Kieran a went on, on a little on a little rant uh, from strategy hey, number two because hey, is, that's what we do. This, this is people like France tangents. Uh, of course, that, true. We are saying that user generated. SEO looks are a thing. Multiple businesses have grown to be billion dollar businesses through this one tactic. Again, not great at all the things, great at one thing. And so one way you can think about this is what are really great examples that I have across my different marketing channels or the things that I am publishing that I can start to figure out how to get some of the community involved, starting to add additional value to differentiate the things that I am doing for everyone else. Like how do I incentivize community to like add content? And I think in a multimodal world, and in a chat GBT world, that content has traditionally been text, but actually it could be audio. It could yes. be video. Like you could actually start to have user-generated text, audio, and video because people will be able to create those things much more easily through chat GBT4 and actually be part of your like marketing mechanics. All right, so that's the, that's the second one. You want to add anything to go to the third one? No, I, I, think, I, I think you nailed it. That, that look, community and feedback loops that fuel differentiated content, even in an AI world, is going to be really important for you to bring in and drive people from search. And that is a growth strategy that has created multiple billion dollar companies. And by the way, what do you think? Thousands and thousands of lifestyle businesses as well? Thousands of life. There is a a whole industry of just these SEO user-generated content loops. And they live a great life. And I'm extremely jealous because they're usually millionaires. One person, one person. I should have done that. I should have done that. Uh, look, if we could redo our lives, we'd all make a bunch of different choices. <laughs> but, you know, unfortunately we can't. Uh, that, that's a therapy session for another day. Um, what, what, what is, the, what is, what is uh, your take on the third growth strategy here, Kieran? We, want, we, want, we got one more that we want to leave everybody with. Third one, one that I think is not disruptable by AI. One that Ooh. I think will always create incredible- Saving the best for last. Traction for companies. And this is virality, but not word of mouth virality. It is like manufactured virality or created virality or incentivized virality, which is how do I create great incentives within my product to get my user base to share it and use it with others? And that is how you get some of the fastest growing companies of all time. Now, the biggest, you know, the most common example, I'm not going to really get into the details too much because everyone really knows it uh, for the most part is like Dropbox, Mm -hmm. right? Dropbox where the shining light of the referral model, hey, send it to someone else, get a little bit of space for free. And that's how they started to like really rapidly grow. PayPal was another one that people don't actually understand that 7 to 10% of all PayPal users came from, hey, here's, $20, $20, send it to your friend. And then my friend is like, oh, I got $20. I can gamble on poker on that and lose it <laughs> uh, on a cash game. But I have to sign up to PayPal to get my $20. Um, well, yeah, that's, so th- uh, somehow Dropbox gets to be the OG in this strategy and it's actually PayPal. Yeah, it is actually. PayPal came first. Yeah, yeah I, 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 first. Don't, I don't know how Dropbox got to be the, the OG in, in PayPal is really the pioneer in, in this Brandon, particular play. Incredible, Brandon. Evernote's a really good example of this. So Evernote actually had a pretty interesting way to manufacture, not manufacture virality, but like pour gasoline onto the virality, which is, did you ever read about their ambassador program? No, tell us. Like, this is a cool thing because it's events, which, hey, I love events. You know, you I hate, love You events. hate events so bad. I, I like events when they're done right for everyone watching. <laughs> cut this. Make sure you cut this one out there. It was savage. Right, you, have to cut it. you can include the bit where Kip said so we'd cut something out so people know we'd cut something out. <laughs> All right, so Evernote is actually one of the most, more interesting ones because people can actually really replicate this. So there was the cool story about Evernote. I think a lot of people know this. They were going out of business. Uh, they had no money. And their founder, which is Phil Lidden. Like Phil Lidden, yes. Yeah. Randomly, this user in Sweden who loved the product, like Evernote was one of these products that people just absolutely loved, actually invested 500000 and kept the company alive. So one of their customers oh, kept crazy. the company alive. Yeah, it's a cool story. And so the ambassador program is like, 
basically taken that love for Evernote and then replicating it throughout the world. And so what they got was they got people who love the product and incentivize them with like swag and incentivize them with secret events, secret dinners, all of these kind of things with not money. And all of those users ran events throughout the world, which I think is incredible, right? You don't actually have to pay for it. You don't actually have to do anything for it. You just have to like incentivize them to be closer to the brand. And they wanted that. And so I think that's a, more, a different example from like a Dropbox or a PayPal where it's like inbuilt yeah. into the product. Well, no. And, and, and even at HubSpot, Kieran, like we had that with our HubSpot user groups. Yeah. Like yeah, we have hubs. hundreds of HubSpot user groups around the world that are all self-organized, right? That we provide some status and some, and some swag and some awesome stuff to, in support to those leaders, but they do it all, man. And I think literally any company can take advantage of this strategy. I don't care what your market is. I don't care if you're B2B or B2C. There's always a way to find the right incentive alignment between you and your customers to help grow your business together. And I'll give a quick shout out because we don't talk about Web3 anymore because we <laughs> we, we chase I'm trends. Still I'm still team Web3, <laughs> web, web yeah. by the way. <laughs> but we chase trends. I'm back on the Web3 trend. But you know who's really good at this? Web3 companies because Web3 companies primarily market to developers, not all of them, but like a lot of the larger ones market to developers. What do developers want to do? They want to learn about the product from other developers. And so shout out to like Chainlink are a really good example of this. Oh yeah, Adeline Chainlink, over, Chainlink are really good. Yeah, Adeline over in Chainlink built the marketing team. And I actually got to learn a little bit about what they did. And it really is like incentivizing virality. It's standing up all these kind of community led events throughout the globe and having people like share in the magic of the company in person. And so I think that's a thing that you can either integrate into your product using mechanics like PayPal incentivized through the $20, Dropbox incentivized through space. Back in the day, Loom incentivized through actually getting gated features for free if you shared Loom with other yep. people. And shout out to Loom for getting their product back on track. They had a hard time. And then Chainlink, all these kind of examples Evernote are example of how you can actually still incentivize people in that virality loop, but through like in-person events for these community-led events. So I think that was a great summary of how you leverage virality through incentives, right? Which was growth strategy number three. So let's, let me try to make sure as, you know, somebody who sounds like a frog, like what, what we're talking about today, what you really walk through with people are three strategies that could, can grow a billion dollar company. The first one is all about growing through template creations through organic search, matching what your potential customers are searching for with high value templates to bring them into your company. The second one is all about basically user-generated SEO loops. Rap Genius was your classic example, but there are a lot of businesses who were able to get users to create content and that content enabled them to rank better, get more search traffic and subsequently grow the business. And then the third example, which I, I think is probably my favorite, even though I really do love the template play. It's just the third example is all about how you incentivize your, your users, your customers, your community to help drive growth for your business. Obviously, Evernote is a very classic and famous example, Dropbox, PayPal. But wow, anybody, you could be a B2B services company and go and figure out the right way to incentivize and create value. And that value is rarely giving people money, right? And I think that was one of the key no, points you it's made. Never, it's yeah. status, it's swag, it's access, it's all of those things that ultimately matter. And these, these strategies, I think, are remarkable because they're achievable by anybody. And I think I want I wanted to just close by doubling down on, you only have to do one of them. If one. you got one of these master right, one. you can build a massive, massive company, right? Right. We covered that in the acts. Like we're really talking about how if you want to learn how to build a billion dollar company, you should go back and listen to the three acts that we laid out to do that. We're really talking about the act one. Like you can build yeah. a meaningful company from one thing in that act one stage, which really gets you to like maybe quarter billion dollars in revenue. Yeah. You can, you can build a, ma a massive business. Uh, Kieran. Yeah, I got to tell you, I think you nailed the show today, d despite me kind of coming off the bench and not not delivering an A-plus performance. I'm sorry for the audience that we we went so far that we had to cut a small part of the show out. I will promise that we we try hard to leave everything in, but sometimes we do cross the line. Um, and make sure you subscribe to YouTube <laughs> if you want yes. to see a puppet diskipped in the most incredible way because i am going <laughs> to like write some <laughs> lyrics for this i'm gonna write hold on, some hold lyrics. on. Katie, before we leave you are you're committing that every lyric that this 
puppet spits I, I will, is, I will is, not get the from you. Lyrics. Oh, it's no, going to be from me. No, yeah, no AI be, or no no freelance no rapper anything. No, okay. I write my own lyrics. Kid. I don't get ghost writers. I'm not Drake. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Shots fired. All right, then. Okay. Man, this has been a, a fiery episode of Marketing Against the Grain. And we'll be back with everybody real soon. This data is wrong every freaking time. Have you heard of HubSpot? HubSpot is a CRM platform where everything is fully integrated. Whoa, I can see the client's whole history. Calls, support tickets, emails, and here's a task from three days ago I totally missed. HubSpot. Grow better. 